thank you. But if you may stand in just a moment for prayer, if you will, as we bow our heads. Eternal and blessed God, we come into thy holy presence to offer to thee the adoration of our hearts, thanking thee and praising thee for what thou hast done for us. We are unworthy of the blessings that thou hast given us. We would pray that you would be merciful to us and extend thy blessings to us this night. Lord, do not look at our sins, but look at our faith that looks to Christ, who was our sin barrier, who forgive all of our sins and heals all of our diseases. And we believe in him, Lord, and we love him, and we know that your love projected him to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That we do, Lord. And this is the closing night of this two nights gathering here in this lovely city. We pray, God, that somehow that you will forgive us of our weakness and will Take the seeds that's been sown, and may they grow into great fields of souls. Grant it, Lord. Help us now tonight. We stand here not knowing just what to do or say, but we're depending on thee, the author and finisher of our faith, who has given us the promise, if we would open our mouths, you would fill it. And we believe that your word is true. Bless these people. Bless the ministers and the churches and all the laity and the ones that let us have the building, the school, and all together, may we be, may it be a great blessing because we've come together. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Mr. Sweet was just saying that they've taken a little love offering for me. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I didn't come for that, but I appreciate it. My expenses are not too much. I worked 17 years while I pastored the Baptist church and never taken a penny. In. I've never took an offering in my life myself. Never took an offering in my life. And uh, my expenses are not much. They run about $100 a day at my office and home and so forth. Now, that might seem like a whole lot to some, but what do you think Oral Roberts runs a day? It's around 10,000 a day. And Billy Grimm sometimes runs 25,000 a minute on his broadcasting thing. So, see, this is very little. But I've kept my work little and smooth, humble, so that I could come to small groups like this and minister. See, if it weren't up to where I had to have a lot of radio time and television great offices and things, which could have been, then I couldn't have been led, just like I am now, to go to five or six or whatever, and I preached before 500,000 at one time. And if the Lord wants me to go overseas, then he just, somehow, someone sponsors it, and I go overseas, and thousands of people into this great city-wide meetings, he just brings them in somehow, but I don't have to continue with that. So it's just a real lovely life to live by faith. And I'm so happy that God permitted me to come and have this time of fellowship with you people. I hope someday that we meet again. If not no more here, I will meet you over there by the grace of God when it's all over. And you'll hear when I meet you there, I'll have the same testimony I have right now. He's still the same. And now, I'll be praying for you. You be praying for me. And I want to thank you for the little love offering. And, and I have a family, three children, and a wife. And so we have the office. We have our expense. And each week we send out thousands of non claws around the world and letters from many nations. We have, you can imagine, we've got four phones that I can answer by. And sometimes they average around 42 long-distance calls per hour. That's around the clock. And you can imagine what it is. It's a great strain. You could have seen my picture of about eight years ago, and today you wouldn't know it was the same person because of the strain, constantly night and day, all the time. But 
One thing someone asked me, said, Brother Branham, when are you going to rest? I said, when I cross Jordan, there'll be a rest over there for me. Now, the nights are coming. I must work hard now. You work with me by praying for me and asking God to help me to do the best that I know how to win souls for him. And I want to thank the school and some of the custodians that had to be near that let us have this place. I appreciate it. I thank the, ch- the churches that's been our sponsors, the pastors. We sure appreciate that, brethren. I probably never met you in my life. You might have been at a convention somewhere, but I appreciate. I know in a town, an intellectual uh, nation that we live in, to say that you put your hands out and say, here, I believe in this, to sponsor it, it's a great big step. I'm sure God will reward you richly for this step that you've made towards supporting Thank you, each and every one. And now, let us bow our heads again to ask the author to interpret the book for us. Lord, this is thy word. And I'm tired tonight, Lord. This is around 30 nights straight. And I pray that you will help me somehow that I might just be so submissive to thy spirit that the Holy Spirit would take the words and place them right out where they belong. Grant it, Lord. Get glory somehow out of the efforts that we put forth. Bless your children that are gathered here tonight for no other purpose but to worship you. And I pray, Lord, that you'll come and let us worship thee. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've chosen tonight just a little familiar text found over here in the book of the Revelation, and it's the third chapter and the twentieth verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This is rather an unusual text, but you know, God is unusual. He does things in unusual ways. And it's not very much scripture to read, but there's sufficient in there if God will make it revealed to us enough for salvation and for healing for all the world. It's God's eternal word. And the scripture reading positionally fixed tonight is to the Laodicean church age, which I truly believe that we are living in this Laodicean church age. I believe that every minister and Bible reader in this city, if they were here tonight or in the nation, they would admit that this message was to the Laodicean church, which is the last church age that become lukewarm neither hot nor cold, and God was to stew it from his mouth according to the reading. And it's a, the setting of the reading is unusual because it's someone knocking at a door. I just can't call to memory now the, the artist that painted that famous picture of Jesus knocking at the door. But I remember taking the history of that picture, how it was painted. I know it cost the Greek artist oh, many years of his life to make this picture. And all famous pictures, before they can be hauled in the, or hung in the hall of fame, they have to go through the hall of critics first. What a beautiful picture of the church. Before the church can ever be taken out of the critics, It has to go through the critics first, and then it's taken in the rapture to glory after it stood the test of criticism. And it ought to make every Christian happy tonight to know that you can live so in this earth, not being of the earth, just a pilgrim and a stranger, a sojourner here. Knowing this, that our our heritage is not of this world, our kingdom is not of this world, it's of the world that is to come. 
knowing this, that we're living in what they call the day of man. The day of the Lord will come. That will be the day for his church. All these things are earthly and will perish. And notice what our Lord said. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Every son that cometh to God must first be tried, chastened, child trained, no exceptions. Every son that cometh to God must be tried. And if we cannot stand the chastisement, then the scripture says we become illegitimate children and not the children of God. And is it a grand feeling to know that God's grace has carried some of you here through 20 and 30 years of trials and persecution? God did that for you. Shows that you're a real child of God. And he's taken you into his fellowship. Someday, in the face of all that has criticized you, you'll be glorified and made a body like unto his own glorious body at his coming. We wait for that blessed hope. And then this great picture as it was passing through the critics, there was one outstanding critic who came and he said, Sir, I think your portrait of Christ is beautiful. And I think that the door and the setting and coming at night time in the darkness and knocking at the door. I think that that is very setting of Revelation 3.20. But he said, there is just one thing that you forgot to do, sir. And the artist said, what would that be? He said, you forgot to put a latch on the door. If the man would say, come in, how could he come in? when there's no latch for him to come in by. Oh, the artist said, I painted it thus. You see, on, in this case, the latch is on the inside. And that's the way it is. The latch is on the inside. Christ knocks at the door, but you have to open the door. He will not against your will. He gives you ability to let him in, but he will cannot force himself in for there's no latch for him to come in by. You must open the door. And then what would anyone knock at a door for? What would be the object of someone knocking at a door? It's trying to gain entrance inside to, with a message, with a presence, or with a commission or something that the one is knocking is trying to get to the inside to see who is inside. And this has been done by friends and foes through the age. For instance, what if the great days of the great Caesar Augustus, what if he would have come down to uh, one of the peasants' houses in Rome and it would have knocked on the door of this poor, down in more the trashy part of the city where the poor live, and the great Augustus would have come down and knocked at the door of some poor peasant. And the peasant would have went to the door and opened the door, and there stood the great Caesar. What do you think that peasant would have thought? Me, a poor man, can hardly know how to get from one meal to the other. And here's the emperor of the nation standing at my door. What an honor that would have been for the peasants, the poor man. Because Caesar was the most important man in the whole Roman world. So... It would have been a great honor for him. Now, and so he would have said, Great Emperor, come into my humble home. If there is anything in my home that you desire, it's yours. You may have it. 
If there is anything that I can do to help my great emperor, this I will do. Because it's the importance of the person at the door. What makes it so real? Or what if just recently in Germany, when the late Adolf Hitler, the great fear of Germany, what if he would have come down to one of his soldiers' house, just a little foot soldier, and would have knocked at the door and the little soldier would have went and looked around the window and would have saw it was Hitler at his door, the greatest man in Germany, standing at the door of a foot soldier. Watch quickly, he would have opened the door and would have come to a pension and with the German salute, and then he would have perhaps knelt on his knee and said, Great fear of Germany, you've honored my little place of abode. Come in, kind sir, and if there's anything in my house that you want, it's yours. I'm so honored to have you, the great dictator of Germany, to come into my house or to even come to my yard and knock at my door. Sure it would have been great honor. And he would have let Mr. Hitler in and anything he desired, he could have had it. And tonight, if our dear president, Dwight Eisenhower, would come to the house of the best Democrat there is in this city and knock at the door. You might differ with him with politics, but it would be an honor to know that Dwight Eisenhower knocked at your door, any person here. That's right. Because he is one of the greatest Americans there is. He's the president of this United States. And a good Democrat would have felt honored to have Dwight Eisenhower at his door. Or what if the Queen of England that recently visited uh, Canada, then she made her way down to the United States. And what if she had come here and went down to a, a little shack where I'd probably live here. Or the, say, the poorest person in the city and would have humbled herself and would have knocked at the door or would have knocked at your door. And you would have went there to the door and seen that it was the Queen of England. Why, you would have felt honored because she's a great woman. I got to see her once. I saw the old mother queen. I got to see him when... King George, just when he still had his multiple groceries for he sent for me, come pray for him. And when they passed down the street in Canada, and standing there, there was the queen in her beautiful uh, blue dress, and King George with his setting up straight, suffering with ulcers in his stomach and multiple sclerosis, which they said he was suffering tremendously that day. But you'd have never noticed that this is straight. Why? He was a king. And he conducted himself like a king. And I noticed Mr. Baxter, which used to be my campaign manager, he just wept when he seen them pass. And I said, Ernie, what you weeping about? He said, Billy, there goes the king and the queen that all oh, aren't they lovely I said yes Mr. Baxter they are but I thought if a, a subject of King George would have felt that way when he passed by what will it be when Jesus comes the king of glory how will his subject feel when he passes by the schools and let the little children out and give them little flags and told them, 
little British flags, and they wanted to be patriotic. They wanted to make him welcome. He had knocked at the nation's door. And the teacher dismissed the little fellow, and they go out on the street, and when the king came by, they would wave their little British flag to show that they were loyal to him as the king. And a certain school, one little child did not return. So the teacher ran out into the streets looking to see where the child was. And she found this little girl leaning against the telegraph pole just weeping her little heart. And the teacher said, What's the matter, honey? Uh, did you not get to wave your flag? And she said, Yes, teacher. I, I waved my flag. She said, Well, did the, did the king pass this way? And she said, Yes, teacher. The king passed this way. Or said, did you get to see the king? Said, yes, teacher, I saw the king. Or said, what you weeping for then, honey? She said, you know, I'm so little. I saw the king, but the king didn't see me. And she was disturbed. Oh, how different it is with Jesus. No matter how small you are, how poor you are, any little worship, he'll see it. And this great queen, his daughter, if she would come to your house, a woman of that caliber, and would humble herself to come to your door, and knock and you'd know who she was, you'd say, Oh, great queen, yet you're not her subject. But come in. You're welcome into my house. And anything that's in here, you may have it, no matter how much you treasured a little trinket. It would be hers because you'd feel honored to, to surrender this, so you thought much of it. You'd surrender it to the great queen of England, it would be a it would be an honor for you. And if she would humble herself like that, every newspaper throughout the world would pack it. The great Queen of England humbled herself and went to New Haven, Connecticut, and to the poorest person there was there and went into their home. Or well, the television would pack it. All the radios would blast it. It would be on the Associated Press. Sure, she humbled herself. And anything that was in your house, she'd be welcome to it. You wouldn't turn her away, certainly not. Because she's so important. But I want to ask you something. Who's more important than Jesus? Who could be more important, and who's more turned away than Jesus? He's turned away more than anybody ever was turned from any door. And he don't want to take nothing from you. He wants to give you the best thing that you could ever have, eternal life. And yet he's turned away. He wants to heal you when you're sick. But he's turned away. Oh, how he must feel. If I knocked at your door and you would let me in and say, Brother Branham, come into my house. You're, you're just welcome here. I'll be glad for you to visit with me. Oh, I would appreciate that. And then I'd just feel at home. I'd go right in and if I want to take off my shoes and lay across the bed, I would do so. If I want to go into the refrigerator and make me a great big sandwich and eat it, I'd feel welcome. And I'd just go ahead and make myself at home. But when Jesus comes in, he isn't welcome. Now I want to ask you something. You say to me, Brother Branham, I've already let Jesus in my heart a long time ago. 
Well, I sure appreciate that. That's very nice. But did you just let him in as a fire escape? Did you let him in to save you from hell? Or did you let him in to have full control in your heart? To be welcomed. Many people will let him in the door, but they won't let him be Lord. Lord is ruler, ownership, possessor. People let Jesus in. I don't want to die unsaved, Lord. I don't want to go to the devil's hell. So I'll accept you as my personal Savior. But when he comes in, can he be Lord over your house? Is he welcome? Now, here's where I want to speak for the next few minutes. In your heart, you've got a lot of little secret closets that you don't want Jesus to come into. That's the little doors inside the door. Now, as you turn the corner to the right, after you come in, where Jesus, you accept him in as your Savior, but you say, now look, Jesus, you stand right there. Don't you go to meddling in my business now or any of my societies or telling me what I have to do or like or what I have to wear or what I have to do. You stay right there. Don't let me go to hell. Sorry for you to stay there, but don't you meddle in my private life. Oh, we each have a little private life all of our own. And we don't want nobody tampering with that. I've got my own ideas of things, so you just stay away. Now, would you feel right if you come to my house and I say, Brother Bram, I was at your, your meeting in New England. I'd say, how do you do? Step in. Or what if you, I'd say, now, but don't you move from this spot. You stay right here. Don't you meddle around in here anywhere. You'd feel not welcome. You'd probably go back out the door. And I wonder if that isn't the reason that we come and get all worked up during the time of revival and after a while we find ourselves right back into the world again. It's because we don't let Jesus become Lord of our lives. We won't let him surrender our own private life and all, all we are over to him. That's what he wants in for is to take control of you. And the first thing, if we say, no, 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 I don't want you to do that. Well, I play cards, but don't, don't, don't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman. I, I cut my hair, but I know the Bible says I do. Don't, don't, no, don't, don't tell me that. See, I wear manicure or what you call that stuff you put on your face. I know women don't do that. And I suppose you that the Bible said they shouldn't. But, uh, but uh, don't you tell me about that now. First thing you know, he's right out the door again, and you're in the same shape that you were before he come in the door. He's not welcome. Now, don't tell me that it's going to hurt me to go to a little dance now and then. And the Joneses and all of us come over and have just a few little bottles of beer and a sociable drink on Christmas Day and so forth. Now, don't go to tampering with that. See, he walks right out the door. That's the reason that we have the trouble in the churches that we've got. It's because we're Jesus, they accept him as Savior. Just recently when the great famous preacher Billy Grimm and our paths across many times overseas, taking the same stadium. But I never had the privilege of shaking his hand until he come to Louisville, Kentucky. And Dr. Mordecai F. Ham, which is a bosom friend of mine, an old Baptist preacher friend that we've associated together since I was a little boy. Billy is one of his converts to Christ. So I was eating breakfast with Mordecai Ham, and, and Billy came down after speaking and raking the preachers over the coals for about a half hour and telling how lazy they were and didn't get out and work and set their feet up on the table or on their desk and so forth. And he gave them a real good old gospel thrashing. And I was introduced then to Billy Grimm, a wonderful man, a great servant of Christ. And Billy took the Bible and he said like this. He said, here is the example of Christianity. Paul went into a city and had one convert. Next year when he came back, that convert had one thirty. Said, I go into a city 
and have 20,000 converts come back a year later and can't find 20. Says, what's happened? He's laying it on to the preacher. I thought, Mr. Grimm, you have your own category you work in. Anointed like John the Baptist was, doing no miracles but preaching the gospel. Following John came Christ, not a mighty preacher, but great signs and wonders. Christ never drew the crowds that John did. But I thought of that spirit up on him, a moving as it was with John. I thought, here's where it is, sir. You see, under the emotion of the great crowds and the people come in and accept Christ, but they won't let him have the right of way in their hearts. They turn him back out again. Don't fool with my private life now. When the Holy Spirit says it's wrong for you to do so and so, oh, you don't want to fool with that. See? No, sir, if it's going to interfere with me and the Joneses, well, then I don't want nothing to do with it. It must be fanaticism. And you'll finally drift off in some big cold marg or something, and that's the way you get it. Now, now that's what takes place. And Jesus is not welcome if he can't come into your private life. If Christ can't be controller, Lord, over all your being, then he doesn't be nothing to you. Then there is another little door of pride. Oh, that sure is a great door in the human heart in this 20th century. People want to feel like that they're just somebody. I just want you to stop a minute and take analysis. Who are you anyhow? Do you think the world would stop turning if you died tonight? Do you think it would weary God or the angels or so forth? Maybe in two days from now, if you're a very important man, you'd never be known anymore just among your relations. Here a lot long ago, I was standing at, I love art. And I like to see where the sculptures have made great artistic work and painters and so forth. And I was at a certain museum in Tennessee. And there was a two young men sitting there looking at a, a paper that was laying with the little dippers of stuff, material. And one of the boys looked at it. He turned back and said, Come here, John, and look at this. I was looking over the boy's shoulders, reading, and it was given the analysis of a male, which is more valuable in weights and so forth than the female. And a man weighing 150 pounds, you know what he's worth? 84 cents. And then you'll put a $100 suit and a $50 hat on your 84 cents. And some of you women will take a $500 mink coat and go to church on Easter morning with a little certain bonnet sticking up with your nose up in the air. If it rain, it would drown you. And then, what are you worth? 84 cents. But, oh, you think you're pretty. But remember, there'll come a day you may be pretty, but you'll be nothing but the skin worms will crawl in and out of that flesh. And maybe by this time next week, it'll be doing that. You know what I mean? Oh, you say, Mr. Branham, I'm an official here in the city. Somebody else will take your place. And you'll be forgotten when the worms are eating you up. And this certain boy said to her, and he said, John, we're not worth very much, are we? So don't look like we are. We'd have to weigh 150 pounds to be worth 84 cents. So they were standing there, and I tapped them on the shoulder. I said, boys, pardon me just a minute. I said, I was looking to it. That's because I'm amazed. I said, I'm under 150 pounds. But I said, there's just one thing I want to tell you. That's this. You may not even be worth 84 cents in chemicals of your body, just enough or whitewashed to sprinkle a hen's nest and a little bit of potash and so forth. You might not be worth 84 cents, but you've got a soul in you that's worth 10 million worlds. If you went to a restaurant and got a bowl of soup, there was a spider in it. Oh, my! 
how you would sling that back and your face turn red and you'd call the proprietor. You said, do you want to poison me? A spider in your suit. I'll never eat here again. Throw your napkin on the table and walk out puffed up like a big toad frog eating buckshot. Then you'd, but you'd think you're somebody. But then the devil can poke any kind of a old dead religion down your throat well that soul that's worth ten million dollars and you receive it. What are you anyhow? Who are you? Where did you come from and where are you going? All the poets and everything else. We've got no book that tells it but the Bible. It tells who you are, where you come from, what you are, and where you're going. God's looking glass. You ought to look into it once in a while. There are so many creeds and so forth. Yes, Jesus walks into that door of your pride. Now, you're not going to like me, you women, after this. But this may be our last time meeting. It used to be in the Baptist church, the old Southern Baptist, the one I come out of. Now, you Northern Baptists, I don't know about you. But I'll tell you, the old Southern Baptists, we didn't walk up with a dried confession, get back in the room and put our name on the book. We get out the altar and pray and beat one another in the back till we come through. That's what you need again. We had something. We found Christ. That's been 29 years ago for me that I've been preaching. 28 years. He gets sweeter each day. It's something that happens. And when Christ comes into your private life, He changes all your life. And it used to be wrong for our Baptist women to cut their hair and to wear manicure or the stuff that you put on your face. I know I say that wrong, but whatever what it is, paint. Uh, that, it's wrong. And today, an old Methodist preacher used to sing a song, Brother Kelly. He and Sister Kelly, they say, we let down the bars, we let down the bars, we compromise with sin. We let down the bars, the sheep got out, but how did the goats get in? You let down the bars. That's easy. It's because the pulpit got weak. And his parish was a meal ticket in a city of commission from God. Listen, ladies. This is not a joke. And this is no place to joke. But I want to say something to you. There was only one woman in the Bible ever painted her face. And that was Jezebel. God fed her to the dogs. So you see what God thinks about women that does that? Now you say, wait a minute, preacher. There you are. You don't want to open that door, do you? That has nothing to do with it. The Bible says it does, but you don't want that door open. You don't want Christ to come in. The Bible claims that if a woman cuts her hair a lot, her husband has a right to divorce her and send her away. The Bible says so. She dishonors her husband and a dishonorable woman shouldn't be led with. Or you say, I'm just as pure as a lily. That might be true, sister. It's because the preacher never told you about it or either your stubborn will that won't let God come in. Maybe it didn't come into the preacher's heart. I know that's rough. I don't mean to hurt you, but... That we can't handle the gospel with white gloves on no more. You've got to pull your gloves off and tell the truth. Amen. That's what people like. Amen. And all this modern day, when you women let your girls, and even you, Grandma, get out on the street with them little old ungodly clothes on and call yourselves Christians? Oh, you say, I don't wear shorts, I wear slacks. That's worse. The Bible said that a woman that will put on any garment that pertains to a man is an abomination in the sight of God. Little old clothes. Mrs. Dale and Mr. Bale and I was going down the street and they had a statue standing there when it looked like a sack pulled over a woman. And, it was so, and let me ask you something. Do you realize this, my sister? 
that if you dress like that, may you be pure to your husband. And you, girl, you may be pure to your boyfriend. You're going to be answered at the day of judgment for committing adultery. Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already. No matter how pure and clean you live, if you present yourself to a man like that on the street, God is going to make you answer for committing adultery. You place yourself out there for that sinner to look at, you're guilty of an adultery. Oh, you say, Brother Van, that's the only kind of clothes they sell. Well, they still sell sewing machines and they have goods. Now you say, Brother Van, you're really beating us women. All right, here you men are. Any man that'll let his wife smoke cigarettes and wear clothes like that, it shows what he's made out of. He's not much man to him. A man that would do that. God give us old-fashioned, born-again, sainted, godly homes. Juvenile delinquency will be no more. It isn't juvenile delinquency, it's parent delinquency. They had the old woodshed and the big hickory lamb laying over the door. That's discipline in our home. All right. You say, now, Brother Branham, I, we shouldn't hear that kind of stuff. You should hear it. Right. You don't let God in that private life. You won't let him in that little cell of yours on the inside. Now, don't you tell me what I'm to put on, what I'm to wear. Don't you tell me how I'm to act. And if I want to smoke a cigarette, that's up to me. Go ahead. It, if you love the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. The Scripture says. Now, that's the little private door. Let's hurry. Get to another door right quick. I want to speak about it. And that's the door of faith. The reason we can't have miracles no more, or like they ought to be among the people. Why? Is because the door of faith has been closed. Now you say, I go to church, Lord. I've accepted you as my Savior. But I believe that the days of miracles is past. How can God work in a heart like that? You've got your mind made up. You're going to do what you want to do. God can't tell you nothing. Then if he can't do that, how can he give you faith? Why don't you just let him stand in the door? And every word that he says in the scripture, you say amen to it and accept it. That's what takes place when Jesus stands in the door of faith. Then it says another thing in here. You've got a, a door to your eyes. And oh, that's a great door. A door to your eyes. You know... We see things. Us American people have been spoiled. God has sent us great revivals and great things and great gifts. And it's become common to us. Some time ago, a, a man was going down to the sea to take a rest. He wanted to smell the salt water and hear the gulls hollering the great big beautiful waves leaping and, and the white caps on the blue sea as it pulled down the skies into it, and he thought it would be a thrill. He had never seen it before. And on his road down, he met a certain sailor coming. He said, where goest thou, my good man? He said, down to the seashore to rest, and my soul will be thrilled when I can see the great salty water and hear the waves roar and the gulls and so forth. Why, he said, I was born on the sea. There's nothing thrilling about it. He's just seen it so much until it wasn't a thrill to him. That's the way of a lot of things with you full gospel people. You've seen God do things and miracles and work among you until it's become common. You don't, don't thrill you anymore. The presence of the Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't give a joy and a great zeal to go. Why? It's in the Lady Ocean Church age. Lukewarm. That's the day that we're living. That's the day that Christ said I'd stand and knock. Now notice... As we're closing and go to start the prayer line. Just this in closing. He's standing knocking. He wants to get into the door of your pride, the door of your private life. He wants to get into the door of your faith so he can make you believe him. He wants to get in there and get the preacher out of your door. 
If the preacher stands in the door, then Christ can't stand there. You listen to what the preacher says. Listen to what God says. Or the denomination gets in your way. Anything that's in the way, brush it aside and say, Come in, Lord Jesus. I welcome you. You're knocking at my door. You come in. I want you to speak to me as I read your word. Give me faith to believe it, Lord. Not what anybody else says that they say the days of miracles is past. If you say they're still the same yesterday, today, and forever, I believe you. There you are. Then your eyes. You know the Bible said here that you are the day, a very beautiful picture of the church. Because you say I am rich and increased in good. The biggest churches we ever had, the best trained preachers we ever had. Increased in good. And have need of nothing, nor sound not, you don't know it, that you're naked, miserable, poor, blind, and don't know it. If a man on the street, could you imagine, you people, of seeing someone on the street that was walking down the street just as heavy as they could be, and they were naked, and poor, and blind, and wretched and disgraced. And you'd walk to him and say, Sir, just a minute. Here, you, you don't realize you're blind. You don't. Get away. I know right where I'm at. You keep your mouth shut. There's something wrong with that person. They're mentally wrong. Here the other day, a woman in Louisville, she was taking her little boy around to the places and uh, uh, counters of this 10 cent stores. And she said, look, honey, the little fellow said, staring. And she took him to another counter. She said, look, honey, and he just stared. And the people began to watch her. And finally she picked up a little trinket that made a noise. She said, look, honey, and the little fellow just stared. And she fell across the counter screaming. And the people come to find out if they could comfort her. Said, what's the matter? Said, he's a little human being. Said, he's the, he's the offspring of our union, husband and I. And said, he's got to a place that he won't even notice things that pertain to human beings. His mind has become addled, and he just stares. If that ain't a condition of the church today, God showing Billy Grimm's all Robert's great signs and wonders. And the church says, that's not my denomination. Just stare. Become spiritually insane. Just stare. Oh, this is my church. That's not the sign that follows the believer. They listen to the church and forget the Spirit of God that makes you act Christ-like. That makes you love Him and believe Him. But what's happened? Their eyes are blinded. They can't, you say, I have 20-20. But you see, the blindness he's talking about is spiritual blindness. A fellow said to me some time ago of a certain church, that don't believe it. They say they speak where the Bible speaks in silent words, silent. And I said, well, sir, what about a certain... He said, I don't care what you'd say, Mr. Branham. I don't believe it. I said, it wasn't made for unbelievers. It wasn't sent to unbelievers. It was sent to those who believe. You're an unbeliever. And what a pitiful shape you are that the devil has blinded you. He said to me, he said, smite me blind. And I said, you're already blind, sir. He said, my eyesight's perfect. I said, but your spiritual sight. He said, oh, blindness means your regular eyes. I said, what about Elijah down at Dothan? That day when they woke up that morning and the Syrians had surrounded the army, had surrounded the city to come in and get Elijah. Because he was telling them their secrets and so forth. And they hated him. And Gehazi woke up and said, Oh, my father. He said, Looky here. The Syrians has the whole city surrounded. And we're in the middle of them. And Elisha, that old prophet, raised up and rubbed his eyes. He said, But there's more with us than there is with them. Gehazi looked around. He said, I, I, I don't see nothing, nobody, but just you and I. He said, God opened this boy's eyes. And when his eyes come open, around that old prophet stood angels of fire and chariots of fire by the millions. 
See, Gehazi was blind. And then he said, come, go with me. He walked out to the chief captain and he said, raised up his hand when he went to the gate and said, Lord, smite him blind. And he walked out to the chief captain and said, are you looking for your life? He said, yes, so we are. He said, come follow me, I'll take you to him. Blind and looking right at him. Blind with it being a lancer. That's what it is tonight. The church. Stop being merciful. They're blind. You will know that Jesus Christ is here on earth today, the same as he was yesterday and will be forever. Is spiritually blind. They don't know the, the devil has blinded them. The Bible said Jesus had done so many things. They called him Belzebub and so forth. Because they, the prophet said they got eyes that they can't see. And the scripture heard Jesus speaking that the church would be in that condition in the last days. And she forget this. You got good churches, you got smart men. You got plenty of money, well dressed. But you're blind. Naked, no covering, no blood, no sanctifying grace upon you. Living in the world, if you, if you were sanctified by the Spirit of God, I'd even holy it, His holiness. See, that's different. Live different than what people do. Well, I'm not talking about maybe just this individual sitting here. You know who we're sitting where it is. I'm just responsible for telling it. Blind. When I was a little boy down in Kentucky where I was born, we had a little old cabin, no floor on it, and a stump for a table, and, and a little old rail put it on the side, and a bunch of chuck laying in there with Papa and Mama Chuck, an old chuck mattress and a chuck chair. Summertime, they'd get straw when we could get it, and make this straw bed, and we little kids slept upstairs in just a little. Two little limb saplings with little sticks of wood across it. We'd go up and go to bed. Had just a shuck mattress laying there, and we'd get on it, and, and the old cardboard shingles shrinking up and great big holes in. Mama used to put a piece of canvas over us to keep us from getting wet when it would rain. And I remember too that the draft through that nighttime would get cold in her eyes, and we, it, we, Mama called it matter. The little, our little eyes would stick together. And she said, the cold wind done it, drafting through the village. And at night time, in the morning when she would call us, she'd say, Billy, I said, well, come on down. Bring Edgar with you so he won't fall coming down the steps. And I'd try to get my eyes open, and I'd say, Mama, I can't see. My grandpa was a, a trapper, a hunter. And he'd say, He'd trap coons, raccoons, and he'd take the grease off of it and make it called coon grease, and Mama would set it on the little old stove and get it hot, and she'd rub our eyes and massage it with this coon grease so that the cold would go out of our eyes and we could see. Then after the coon grease was applied, warm coon grease, until our eyes got all the matter out of them, she'd wipe them out, and then we could see to where we were going. And there's been a Spiritual death comes through the church in America, and they caught a spiritual cold, and their eyes are stuck together. Jesus said, Counsel of me and by eyesight, that you might anoint your eyes. Brother, coon grease might work for the literal body, but it'll take more than coon grease to work for your spiritual eyes. It'll take an old-fashioned god baptism of the Holy Spirit. The oil of God's Spirit to open the eyes that's been caught in this draft of sociology, all, all kinds of theologies and everything is so mixed up in such a conglomeration with all kinds of jokes and carrying on and nonsense and ill living and just waiting in sin. The nation is so populated and sins come in and it's caught our people. Used to be the vulgar was in Paris. We have to go to Paris to get our, our, our modern dressing for women. We got so dirty and low down that Paris has to come over here and get their modeling from us. 
What a disgrace! And you break motherhood, you broke the backbone of any nation. There's we got rock and roll. Even a policeman can't be at peace on the street. Teenage life stabbing them and everything else. It's because that the spiritual draft come through. The home life broke down. What is it today that the modern church member, dad's down in the somewhere playing a deck of a uh, game of poker, mama's out somewhere with some of her uh, societies and, and sis is over at the canteen and at a rock and roll party and junior's got his hot rod out somewhere. The church sets empty. That's the way of the modern church today. No wonder Jesus said, I'll spew you from my mouth if they'd open them doors of pride and selfishness and indifference and the door of faith and uh, let God put some salve on their eyes and open their eyes, they'd see that he remains the same yesterday and today and forever. They'd see his goodness. But it's such a pity. That's the reason people are so hard to get them to stay in church. Right up here in your own state, a little above here, I used to hunt with a buddy of mine. He was a good man. But the church, the people on the street are looking to see something genuine. And this fella, he was a good hunter, and he, I used to go up and hunt with him, but he was the meanest man I ever met. And he, he used to tell me he'd shoot little fawns when we'd go hunting just to be mean. And it's all right to shoot a fawn if the law, law says so, but, but, but just not kill him to be mean. I'm a conservationist. I was a game warden for years. And I don't believe in destroying them things like that. Shooting little birds for a target. That's wrong. It's sin to do it. And here, if you want a target, go to the range. Don't kill it unless you eat it, but just uh, be mean. And one year I went up to hunt with him and he had made a little whistle. And he could blow that little whistle and sound just like a little fawn, little baby deer crying. I said, Bert, you're not going to use that. Or I said, Billy, get next to yourself. You're just a chicken-hearted preacher. And I said, don't do that. Well, we went hunting that day, and there come a little snow, and we was tracking. And we didn't even see a track. It was about noontime. So he sat down. He reached down in here right by a little opening. I thought he was going to get a sandwich to eat. And he pulled out this little whistle. I thought, oh, you're not going to do that, Bert. And he tucked his little whistle, and he cried like the little baby deer. And when he did, I noticed just across the way, a great big mother doe raised up. And she was looking around. I could see her big brown eyes and those big veins. And she was a mother. Now, that's unusual in hunting season. For a deer to raise up out of that brush, she stays bedded down, especially about 11 o'clock in the day. She's resting. But a baby cried. There was something in her. She was a mother. The baby was in trouble. She began to look. And I seen Bert with those lizard-looking eyes, looked around me, kind of that Satan smile. He pulled the lever back of the boat and throw the shell up in the chamber of that 30 aught six, and he was a dead shot. I turned my head. I thought, oh, my. And he blowed the little whistle again. And the mother there stepped right out in the opening, altogether unusual. And she spotted the hunter. She spooked her. We call it that... Just startled for a minute, but she didn't run. What was the matter? She was a mother. She wasn't just playing church. She wasn't playing loyalty. She had something in her. She was born the mother. Something real. And the hunter slipped his gun down. He put that crosshair right across that loyal mother heart of hers. Hello, God! In a minute, he'll blow her precious royal heart plumb to both sides of her. That big 180-grain bullet mushroom, it'll clean the whole heart out of her. How could he be so brutal as to kill that precious mother who's standing there displaying something that's real? Mother's love. And I turned my head. I couldn't watch it. And I, I thought, oh, God, don't let him do it. And I was listening any minute to hear the roar of the gun, and it would have blown her about ten feet that close to her. I thought her poor heart would be blown out of her. But she's so loyal. And I noticed the gun didn't fire. And I turned around to look, and the gun barrel was shaking like this. 
He looked around, and the tears was running down his cheeks. He threw the gun on the ground. He grabbed me by the trouser leg. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. He said, lead me to that Jesus that you talk about. There on that bank of snow, I led that cruel-hearted man to Christ. Why? Because something had something of real to display. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But the salt lost its Savior. You're just church members. He had something real. And that hunter was looking for something real. And he saw the loyalty of a mother displayed. Not a hypocrite, not a put on, but something real. Oh, don't you want to be real to Christ like that? He knocks at your heart. Let's bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Before we pray, I'd like to ask you this question. Would your heads bowed, please? How many in here would just like to say, God, although I may belong to church, and maybe you don't, but you'd really like to be real. You said, oh, I want to be a real Christian. And you said, God, give me the reality to display Jesus, your Son, my Savior. Give me a real experience and put something in me as real as the love of that mother dear was for her baby dear. Would you just raise your hands up and say, remember me, God. God bless you. All around. God bless you. Yes. There's 20, 30 hands up in the balcony. Put up your hand. God bless you, lady. Someone else that hasn't. God bless you, mister. God bless you over here, sir. You back there, down through the middle aisle. Over to my left. God bless you, young man. Saying, God bless you, young fella. That's very fine. What do you do when you raise your hand? See, you, you defy the laws of gravitation. Science says, ordinarily, your arms have to hang down. Gravitation holds you down. But what's the matter? Your spirit on the inside of you, and a spirit at your door right now. No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And when God is standing there, the eternal life, saying, Child, you're guilty. Make your decision tonight and serve me. Then you defy the laws of nature. You defy the laws of gravitation. You raise your hand towards your Creator. You've made a decision. It shows there's a spirit in your life that can do it. That's what does it. If you really mean that in your heart, God will give you that what you desire. Would there be another or two while we wait? Just remember me, O oh God. All right. That's good. God bless you, young fellow. That's right, teenager. That's, you made the biggest thing you ever done, sister, right at this crossroads of life. You've done something real. You might have done a lot of great things, but that's the greatest thing you've ever done when you raise your hand. Would there be another just before we pray for you? God bless you, lady. That's good. Sister dear, you're up in age, but... You might have done a many great things. Maybe that hand there has rocked the cradle. Maybe pulled the tears back from a little crying baby's eyes. But the greatest thing you ever did when God knocked at your heart and you raised your hand. You two young woman right behind her there. That's the greatest thing you could do when you raised your hand to Christ. Oh, God, be merciful. God, let this young fellow up here in the balcony. Let us pray. Lord God, great Jehovah Creator, be merciful, Lord. And this little broke-up message tonight, many has received you as their personal Savior. And they want a real experience, Lord. They want to be like Jesus. They want to have a real love in their heart that displays the love of God in the people that they work with and associate with and they go to church with. They want something that's real. That You said you're the salt of the earth. The salt, if it contacts, it makes a thirst. God makes them in such a contact with you and so salty as to say, until all their neighbors and whoever they come in contact with would thirst to be like them. Grant it, Lord. They're yours. They're the trophies of the message. And you give them to your Son as love gifts, and no one can pluck them from your hand. You said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment.
but pass from death unto life. Grant it, Lord, they're yours. I may never be able to shake those precious hands that raised in the air, but that day standing yonder, maybe before morning, when Jesus comes, we stand at his judgment seat. Oh, God, you said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That's the only thing that'll be recognized on that day. So, God, I may get to shake their hands and they can tell me that they received you as their Savior right here at this great meeting here in this great city. Grant it, Father, I present them to thee now that thou wilt keep them in perfect peace whose hearts are stayed on you, for I ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I would like for the pianist, if they would, or the organist, whatever, would go to the piano. After the message is over, don't you just love the Word of God? Oh, let's just worship now, just for a moment. Don't you like to worship God? Now, let's, how many know this old song, I love him, I love him because he first loved me? That's good. Give us the card, will you, sister? And now let's just worship God. Don't notice who's sitting near you now. Just look up and praise him. Now, all together. I love him. I love you My faith looks up to thee, will you? Oh, I love this. Don't you just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit? Why, souls come home. Wandering sheep came into the fold. That's what did it. Now, each of you raise your hand. You find out from some of the pastors, get you a good church home. Go to church. If you haven't been baptized, have Christian baptism. You haven't received the Holy Spirit? Now receive it. All together now, come on. Now real sweetly to the Lord. My faith looks up to thee, a thou lamb of Calvary, Savior, divine. How many of you love him? Just raise your hands like this. All right, let's keep them hands up just a minute. While life's dark made thy fret and green around me spread, oh, be thou my God. Turn to day, why sorrow is away. God, let's pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, I just feel real religious. <laughs> you don't think Baptist shouts? Well, I do. <laughs> I just love him. Let's see, prayer card in the hundreds. We haven't got hardly a hundred years. <laughs> let's, I'm not going to use them prayer cards. You don't have to have a prayer card. How many knows that he's present? You believe he's present? How many believe he's the same yesterday and forever do like this? Well, if he is, uh, could he not come here now and anoint uh, me and anoint you? That's the same thing he did in the day of his flesh here on earth. He promised the things that I do, shall you do also. You remember the woman that touched his garment? And he said, Thy faith has made thee whole. Do you remember that? you remember that? Well, isn't he the same God today? And if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, would not God act in the same way that he did yesterday, today, and forever? Well, let's bow our heads and just believe him now. And each one pray, whatever's on your heart, you just ask God to be merciful to you. Now, Lord, the service is yours. And I pray that you'll be merciful now. And let your spirit move into this building and grant eternal God that all that is sick now and all the afflictions and all the sickness may leave this dear people. May there not be one but what will be healed. Your great presence and your great spirit, may it grant this thing to us tonight, Lord. And now the people are submitting their self to you. I'm submitting myself to you. And let your Holy Spirit move in us to honor and to glorify thee, and let the people know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you set some in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, for the perfecting. Grant, Lord, that the people may hear that just received you as their personal Savior. May they see and understand and realize that you're still living tonight. Grant it, Father. This may be strange, but I believe you will do it. Let this act, as we had last night, the woman at the well told the secrets of her heart. May it be tonight that the, that the man, or like Peter, that came and you knew who he was, and like Philip, you know where he was at, and like the woman who touched your garment, and you turned and said, who touched me? And all of them denied it, and you said, I've gotten weak. And you looked around till you found the woman and knowed what her trouble was and told her, and her faith saved her. Grant it, Lord. If you'll do that, we'll be happy. And it'll make a great climax for the meeting tonight. You've been so good to bless us. We just feel refreshed of your presence. Great God of heaven, grant this through Jesus' name, my son. Amen. Now, I do not say that he will. But if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he'll act the same. Now the Bible said he's a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Is that what the scripture says? Now, if he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and he's the same yesterday and forever, would not he have to act the same as he did when he was here on earth? Now you just believe with all your heart that God will grant it. Now, you just look, every one of these strangers to me, I don't know no one in the building but, but Captain Sasquatch here, chaplain. Everyone before me is a stranger. These boys here are these recording boys, I know them. But behind me is the group. How many out there that's really sick and you want Christ to heal you? Just say, I don't care who you are, just raise your hand and say, God, I, I want you to heal me. I want you to heal me. Just be reverent, up the balcony, wherever you are. And if he will act the same now, his spirit, not you can see him, you can see his works. If he'll act the same that he did when he was shown earth, will you all believe him? Amen. 
Bible said two or three witnesses that every word be established. I just be praying. May God grant that he'll he'll come from one side to the other. Let's start over here. Get something out of everywhere in here. If God will do it, I'll watch this side. And you people in these rows pray and believe God. Just remember he's present. Now here it is. Appearing before me is a man. He's suffering with a rupture. Sitting right here. Mr. Shaw. I don't know you do up there. Never seen him alive. That's right. Have faith. You were praying, God let him speak to me. That's right, raise up your hand. What did you touch? You never touched me, did you, sir? But you touched the high priest. He answered back. Someone else prayed. Here's the man and another one sitting right here on you. Suffering with the same thing, a rupture. Hurting. Yes, sir. I don't know you do a sir. Never seen you in my life as far as I know. Your name is Mr. Spencer, though. That is right, isn't it? You believe? Same Christ. Lady right behind him there with the asthma. If you believe and surrender your life to Christ, he'd heal you of it. You believe you'd do it? Will you surrender your life to him? The lady's a little white, a little red rose on her hat. You believe Christ with all your heart. Will you do it? Surrender your life to him and the asthmatic condition will leave you. You'll get well. If you'll accept him as your Savior and your God, you'll grant it to you. I've never seen you in my life. You know that. It's dark and light, too. He wants to give you the blessing, but you accept him first. Just a little skeptic in your life. Get away from that. Believe me. The young lady's prayer did that. What about you sitting here, sir? You got something wrong with your arm right here in the middle row. You believe God will heal you? Your wife sitting there with diabetes, you think that uh, she'd be healed too? I don't know you, do I? But it's Christ. What these people touching? Here, by the way, this woman sitting over here is connected with you somewhere, mother. That's right. You're all together. And you've got arthritis. That's right, isn't it, lady? If you believe, God will make you well. This man sitting right straight back out here, right looking me right in the face. He's wondering if he could touch Christ. He's by you. You got a hernia, sir. You believe that God would make you well of it? If you believe it, you're going to have it. If thou can put back in here, some of you people, have faith and believe. Here, show you grace. Let me show you grace. Here's such a colored man sitting right back here with his head down, praying his hands down like this. Sitting by the side of a white man. Lady sitting next to him there. The man suffering with diabetes. If you believe with all your heart, you can be made well. Would you believe it with him, sister? Would you believe it? I don't know you all, do I? Never seen you, but that's right, isn't it? Raise your hand. Put your hand over on him. But have faith now. See who he is? He's still the same yesterday, day, and forever. The gentleman sitting over here in this next aisle over here. You're suffering with something wrong with your ears. 
And you also have a throat trouble, don't you, sir? Got glasses on, wearing a white shirt. That's right. You're sitting there praying, wasn't you? That's right. God bless you. Have faith in God. Sit right on the front row, sir. But the altars, do you believe that God would make you well? You'd believe it? Young fellow sitting with your head down saying, God, let me be next. That's right. Raise up your hand if that's so. All right, go ahead, your elders is gone, friend. Do you believe he's here? Is that Christ all the way around here? Is that Christ the same yesterday and forever? How many now accept him and says, I know he's here? See, I don't know you people. It's your spirit doing that, see, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Now put your hands over on one another. Let's pray for all, all the people in here. Where was the little baby here was crying a few minutes ago? Put your hands over on the child. All right. Lord God, be merciful just now, Lord, and let thy spirit move in this building and heal every person that's in divine presence. Tonight you have proven yourself to be God. You're God yesterday, God today. You're not a painted bar or a historian God. You are a God that's always been God and always will be God. And Father, I pray that as you have manifested yourself by saving sinners and healing people that was in a place where they couldn't be healed, then they see the miracle of the Lord Jesus. God grant that each one of them may be healed just now. Satan, move out from this building and get out of here. I charge thee in Jesus Christ's name, let these people go. Do you accept your healing? Raise your hand, Sam. Say, Lord, I believe. I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I believe. All right. If you believe it with all your heart, you people that bowed your head a few minutes ago to receive him as Savior, bow your head again just a minute, every one of you. If you'll bow your head just a moment now. Let us right here this moment while you're leaving the chair. God bless you.